it's not something you can be naive about and just brush over. Mm. But um, uh, the fact is, is, is that it's very easy to get hold of to get hold of, 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 of most drugs as it is. And so the system we've got not only doesn't prevent use, but then it creates this entire this entire level of additional harm, which doesn't need to be there. Doesn't need to be there. And the violence yeah. and exploitation in the supply chain. Hi, James. Hi there. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure to have you on. Um, it's a, a group of yours that, um, that I've been really interested to uh, to learn more about since I've been doing the research on you guys. So you're, you're James Nichols. You are the CEO, correct, of um, Transform Drug Policy Foundation. That's right, yes. Yep. Could you just tell me very quickly in sort of like two, two to three minutes exactly who you guys are, why what your role is and how, how that kind of uh, was set up originally. Yeah, so Transform is a, uh, a, a, an independent charity that campaigns for drug policy reform with the goal of uh, achieving drug policy that promotes human rights, uh, social justice and public health. We were founded around 20 years ago um, by Danny Kuslik. Uh, and the, I suppose the unique role that Transform has tended to play in this space, I mean, you know, we're not the only organisation that, that campaigns for drug policy reform, but I suppose the things that Transform does which are which are, are more unique are we have a particular focus on the legal regulation of all drugs so our, our kind of our kind of high level argument is that um, the entire system for regulating or for trying or for controlling drugs at the moment is uh, has failed and needs to be replaced wholesale um, but also that's one of the things that transform has always I think specialized in is uh, not only making the case for why the war on drugs has been a failure, but f but uh, laying out in detail uh, options uh, for practical alternatives to prohibition. So um, setting out you know, licensing systems, uh, models for regulation, making the case for you know how we deal, with, how we would deal with drugs in a post-prohibition world, yeah. and also thinking in practical terms about how. And this is something we'll probably we may come on to. Yeah. How, um, in a post-prohibition context, whatever whatever substance we're thinking about, we can ensure that the regulations that we put in place continue to promote those values of uh, social justice, human rights, and public health that we have as our kind of core principles. Brilliant. And everything you just said there, we'll, we're, we're going to come on uh, to in a little bit and, and go into more detail. So. Um, We've, we've spoken about um, what Transform is and, and, and why it was set up originally. You've also spoken about the fact that there are other groups who sort of work in this sort of anti-prohibition um, space, but you guys have a focus on regulation. So what is legal regulation? Um, and then I have a kind of follow-up question about whether or not there's any sort of, um, if this is just kind of free market, laissez-faire, sort of just let the, let, you know, let the private sector go with it sort of thing. Yeah, so... Um... I mean, the term legal regulation, I think it's quite it's quite important that, that that's the term that gets used because we are talking about uh, regulation and not a free for all. So we're not a kind of uh, we're not coming at this from a, a, a libertarian perspective, particularly, okay. although individual freedoms are important, of course, yeah. uh, but primarily from a position of. Uh, public health and social justice. Mm -hmm. Now, the uh, to achieve public health and social justice uh, in any sphere. Um, but, uh, you know, not least um, the regulation of drugs requires regulation. It requires careful design and planning. It requires uh, uh, licensing regimes that are set up in such a way as to both um, uh, promote public health, but also ensure access to market for people who've previously been excluded or people who are socially excluded for other reasons. Um, and so that's really that's really what we mean by, by legal regulation. What we mean is a, a system of, of um, licensing and other forms of regulated control, which produce the kind of outcomes that we're looking for. So it, it's absolutely not a, a kind of, let's just remove all, all, all constraints and then see what happens because Good. we know where that leads. Yeah, well, as I mean, I'm a, I'm a sort of, I'm a, I'm a Lib Dem, I guess, loosely still at this stage, and obviously this is something the Lib Dems have been banging on about for a little while. I think Caroline Lucas of the Greens as well has been fairly good on this for a little while. Um, so it, is, it, it definitely seems to have some cross-party consensus on 
certainly challenging um, what we're going to come on to talk about in a minute, which is the, the 50th anniversary of the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. Um, so I guess I'll come straight on to that then. So what is the Misuse of Drugs Act um, and why are you guys making a big sort of fuss about the 50th, anif- uh, 50th anniversary of it? Why should anyone in the public care about this? So the Misuse of Drugs Act is really the, the primary legislation under which our uh, drug policy is structured and, and under which our drug strategy is structured. There's some there's subsequent legislation as well, but that's the Misuse of Drugs Act set out the, the, the primary framework for how we deal with uh, what, what would be referred to as controlled drugs. Um, it was implemented in part to, uh, to, to create a, a national implementation of a 1961 United Nations Convention on, on drugs, which required that um, uh, uh, drugs set out in the SUSE schedules in that convention are prohibited, and that the law lays out the punishments for possession, for supply, uh, and for use to align with those uh, international conventions. So I suppose for most lay people, what they'll be familiar with with the Misuse of Drugs Act is the idea of, of scheduling, that we have drugs that are class A, class B, class C, yeah. um, that the uh, punishments for possession and supply are tiered according to those uh, which class a drug falls under, uh, the severity of the punishment, the length of prison sentences and so forth. Um, uh, and, and so I, I suppose in it, what, it, what it establishes in broad terms is the principle that drugs which are uh, scheduled under the Act are prohibited for, for use and for supply. And the question then is just how steep is the punishment and how severe is the prohibition on those yeah. particular drugs? Yeah. Misuse Drugs Act also importantly uh, uh, sets out the, the, the framework for the use of stop and search for suspected possession of drugs, which yeah. um, uh, over the decades has uh, uh, presented all sorts of problems which we may come on to in terms of uh, racial discrimination. Yeah, we will. I have a question about that later. Yeah. 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 But but yeah, so so I mean, essentially, it's it's the overarching framework under which our drug policy and strategy sits. Yeah. Um, and of course, it's the, it's the 50th anniversary of it this this coming year, isn't it? Um, has, has it already passed or is it coming up? Yes, it was. Uh, it was in May. So so May marks the 50th anniversary of it receiving royal assent. OK. Um, the next question I have about is, is, is the sort of the quote unquote war on drugs. Um, and this is something that, that was on your website. It was interesting to read about the kind of history of the war on drugs, sort of um, almost like we've been copying America in, in, in a lot of ways on this, following their lead. Um, so, so what is the kind of, are you able to just quickly track the, what the war on drugs kind of is, how it's been used by politicians, how effective it's kind of been and, and where we are with it now, this sort of quote unquote war on drugs? Yeah, I mean, I'd say that one thing to say about the war on drugs is, is it's, it's, a, it's a war that I suppose started slowly on a number of different fronts and in different countries at different times, mm. uh, really going back to the start of the 20th century originally. So in the very early years of the 20th century, um, we started seeing international conventions primarily directed against the opium trade, which was yeah. ironic, and, we, and we, which in fact the British were opposed to originally because of in the late 19th century we were... Uh, 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 forcing the opium trade on the Chinese. Exactly, and yeah. The opium yeah. So there's an irony there. There is. Um, there's also, uh, uh, and over the years follow, following then, especially during and after World War I, you started to see increased restrictions on um, uh, cocaine and cannabis and opiates in particular, which um, were, the, 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 the law in, in the UK at least was, was uh, 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 developed over the following decades, but then kind of consolidated in 1971. Um, I think there's a number of things that are worth noticing about the, the history of this. Um, one is, then uh, this is kind of just out of interest, I mean, m- prior to coming to Transformer, I, I did a lot of work around the history of alcohol policy and legislation, and mm. almost all of the arguments we now have about uh, other drugs were uh, were very much originally played out around alcohol in 19th, 18th and 19th centuries. We had, mm. leading up to prohibition in America, of course, but we had all these debates around uh, uh, what the role of the state was in, in controlling potentially hazardous substances, uh, whether prohibition was the best approach, whether licensing was the best approach, how you pr- reduced harm most effectively. So there's a whole long history of discussions around this, around alcohol, before we even really started to talk about, about, about other drugs. Yeah. Um, 
the other another thing to kind of bear in mind is that um, people will often say that the war on drugs is is kind of racist in its DNA, and that's true in in in, in the extent to which. Um, uh, for almost all drugs that, that, that were controlled in the early 20th century, there was a significant racial element and a significant element in which drugs were associated with particularly communities, particular migrant communities, uh, especially, uh, and the, uh, the regulation or the, the, the pro prohibition of those drugs was in part uh, a response to kind of moral panics and also just broad racist attitudes towards those communities. So Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. in America, that was the case for Mexicans around marijuana, mm. black communities around cocaine, the Chinese communities around opium. Uh, and in the UK as well, there's a, there was a very kind of strong strain of anti-Chinese racism uh, yeah. around early opium legislation, but also anxieties and, and moral panics around race with mm. early legislation on cocaine and, and cannabis. I remember seeing the posters. I think it was something like, in certain restaurants and parks, no, no dogs, no Irish, no Chinese, or something. Those those famous posters to in, in the fifties and sixties. Yeah, no, yeah. Also, no dogs, no blacks, no Irish was uh, was yeah. quite common in a in a, 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 a accommodation as well. Um, no, absolutely. I mean, and and the the while it's not the only driving factor around why drugs were prohibited it is a very very significant one and i think mm. the legacy that that has left in terms of the way both the policies have operated and the way that they've been represented and the way drug issues have been represented and the way drug problems have been associated with particular communities uh, along racial lines is is unavoidable it's a it's a, a very large part of the of, of, of the discussion, and mm. I think that's partly uh, why, to an extent, there's been a kind of uh, an interest in, in in drug policy, and it's certainly played a, a major role in the in the in the in the changes in drug policy that are happening in in America at the moment. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I think we probably will come back to this at the end, I and mean, we will, obviously we've covered a little bit there. But um, I've got a question on whether or not the the original act is, is, is a racist one, but we'll, we'll leave that for a little bit later. So I know a lot of people that um, are, are sympathetic to the idea of decriminalization and um, potentially also of, of taking control or, or, and, and licensing. Um, but I just wanted to ask you a few of the sort of like, you know, counter arguments that, that, that might get th th thrown at you and your position. So one of the ones I saw from your website was, but legalization won't get rid of organized crime. Therefore, why bother? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's an interesting one that because it's often kind of put forward as a bit of a straw man argument, really. Which is, well, it's not a silver bullet. Mm. In fact, uh, Kit Malthouse in the debate we had in Parliament um, last week on the Misuse of Drugs Act used that very that very line. He said, "Well, he was talking about decriminalisation in that case." Actually, we said it's not a silver bullet. Well, mm. no one's saying that it is. Is the hey. short answer to that? <laughs> no one's yeah. claiming. Okay. that, uh, that uh, 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 either decriminalisation or, or regulation would eliminate organised crime. But uh, 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 crime activity is, is driven by opportunity mm. um, to a large degree. And uh, uh, prohibition creates a huge, huge opportunity for organised uh, crime because it creates such an enormous value additional value for the products concerned and so the profits and the that to be made are vast uh, 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 and um how, how and much so, uh, what what's the value of the industry at the moment in criminal hands um <laughs> you have to do that one out because i'm gonna have to get that numbers back Rough, and, uh, roughly it's, 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 it's in the billions right in the hundreds no, it's, it's, in, it's, in, it's in the hundreds of billions globally yeah. i mean it's yeah. absolutely it's, it's it's one of the it's one of the, you know, the, the, the drugs in the drugs trade globally is one of the three or four biggest uh, markets that there yeah. is in terms of value. Yeah. Um, uh, now, it's not in terms of the kind of physical scale of it, in terms of the amount of, of cocaine that's required to, to, to be transported for a market worth that much. It's not physically that much because the value is so high. You know, you don't need many containers, shipping containers full of cocaine yeah. to service uh, large parts of the market, but those, 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 the the, con the the product is so valuable, and so, and because it's smaller and 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 not that difficult really to 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 transport, um, 
uh, which is another one of the problems of prohibition is that it nudges, as it were, towards very high potency uh, forms of any substance because they're yeah. easier to transport and they're much more, more they're worth more on the on, on the street, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you have so you have a, a, an enormously uh, valuable trade. Now, of course, um, uh, you know uh, there are all sorts of other opportunities for organized crime to operate in human trafficking sex trafficking whatever else it may be we know yeah. we know that those things exist yeah. what we're saying that regulation will achieve is to remove one of the most lucrative and the most attractive uh, uh, of those opportunities that you have to uh, to, to to create wealth uh, in in kind of parallel unregulated markets. So when the, uh, you know, whenever anyone says, "Oh well, it wouldn't get rid of organised crime," I always think, "Well, no, of course it won't." But it will it, it will significantly reduce yeah. uh, uh, those opportunities. Exactly, and reduction is better than doing nothing. Of course, I mean, so it's, it seems like an obvious answer, really, doesn't it? Yeah, but I, but I, I think that's an important point as well around around drug policy reform. I think often people look at it and, and they think, "Oh, well, that's very utopian and very kind of like idealistic." Mm. Um, Transform uh, is not a, a, a utopian organization by its nature, and I'm certainly mm. not a, a kind of a, a, a utopian uh, instinctively. Mm. It's, uh, it's actually an incredibly pragmatic mm. set of questions you need to ask. It is about reducing harm, not, not, not eliminating it altogether. Yeah. It's about reducing opportunities for, for, for people to, to uh, well, it's about reducing risks, it's about reducing hazards, it's about, it's about reduction of harm. It's, yeah. it, no one's saying, we will have some kind of amazing utopia in which uh, you know all, all things will be well and everyone will be happy forever after what we're saying is when you have a huge policy failure on this scale that causes such enormous damage to individuals and communities uh, you should be doing what you can to reduce it of course um those that will come at you with the argument that will look if you legalize drugs there will be a massive surge in increased drug use um, and there will be lives ruined, lives lost, and there'll be a massive strain on the NHS, will fall into crisis and it'll be chaotic. What do you say to those people? Well, the, uh, the evidence from the legal regulation of cannabis in Canada uh, and states in America and elsewhere is not that you suddenly have a huge spike in use. Mm. If anything, use flat lines broadly doesn't really change all that much um i don't now it's not to say that you should be naive about that i don't think you should be naive about the risks um you know part of the 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 the, the issue with um alcohol and the scale of alcohol harm compared to other drug harm which is which is enormous mm. um is that when you have a poorly regulated uh, industry that is supplying a product which can be risky and alcohol is up there at the top of the kind of risky drugs yeah, that we have totally. available to us. Yeah. Um, you need to be you need to be cautious in your regulation. So you do need to have uh, uh, licensing systems that work and you do mm. need to have uh, 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 um, uh, systems and, and, and taxation policies and pricing policies in place that uh, don't encourage excessive use. Um, but the 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 um, the there isn't uh, evidence from where from where legal regulation has happened that, that use increases particularly. There isn't, I don't think, a particular reason to imagine that suddenly people are, would anyway just suddenly become kind of like voracious consumers of all drugs mm. because they're no longer available in the way that they are now. Mm. And also, uh, it's not hard to get hold of any of these substances already if you just ask around and, and you know is is i mean there was a report from public health england a couple of years ago where they did some qualitative work with people who 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 who, who bought drugs and the the line that was used then it's been used elsewhere it was, it was as easy as ordering a pizza i mean there's so there's not the barriers to, yeah. to access are, 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 are not that high um so that's um you know i, I think again it's not something you can be naive about and just brush over. Mm. But um, uh, the fact is, is, is that it's very easy to get hold of, to get hold of, 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 of most drugs as it is. And so the system we've got not only doesn't prevent use, but then it creates this entire, this entire level of additional harm, which doesn't need to be there. Doesn't need to be there. And the violence yeah. and exploitation in the supply chain. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about specifically like cocaine and heroin, because um you know a lot of people i know sort of smoke smoke weed and it's, it's, i think that's got more of a fluffy um uh, pr these days but um 
when you compare heroin and cocaine to say i don't know tobacco or, or okay or even alcohol where do they compare in terms of how much they can ruin a life are if we were to legalize and regulate for heroin and cocaine, they would have to be very, very tightly regulated, wouldn't they? Because otherwise they do have the capacity to ruin lives in a way that maybe alcohol wouldn't. Or am I wrong with that? Well, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, so first thing I'd say is in terms of relative risks, the, um, the, the, the comparative risk analysis that, that uh, David Nutt and, and his team did a few years ago, which has become the kind of standard measure of, of risks, has, yes, uh, heroin, uh, crack cocaine as, at an individual level, higher than for alcohol, although alcohol makes up for that in terms of the risks to others from people who, who get drunk, because as we all know, okay. um, alcohol is one of those drugs, it's not the only one, but it's one of those drugs where the person taking it can be fine, but mm. people, some people think it can also be pretty antisocial and can cause yeah. all sorts of, you know, all yeah. sorts of problems. Yeah. I mean, alcohol is also associated with over 60 health conditions and is responsible for a huge number of hospitalizations and deaths every year. It's, yeah. it's, it, it's like, it's not a particularly, it's not, it's not a kind of, a, 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 you know, a, a risk-free job by any stretch of the imagination already alcohol. Having said which, um, uh, so in our, in our proposals for regulation, we don't, suggest that uh, that you could simply walk into a corner shop or a or a uh, the equivalent of a pub and buy yep. as much of any substance as you want nice. so heroin you know we would we would see as being uh, continuing on a prescription model which it kind of it was under the british system and yeah. to an yeah. heroin we're gonna we've got, i've got i've got a question on the types of um re regulation in a minute which, which i took from your website um mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll come back to that but um if drug use is legalized Cocaine and heroin um, have more of an ability to to affect lives, so we're we're definitely certain that it would need to have a, a different level of of, yeah. of regulation compared to the others. Okay, good. Um, so I wanted to ask you because obviously one of the case studies that I remember looking at when I was at school, I think it was, was um, actually no, it must have been later, was Portugal. They had a massive um, crisis, didn't they, with, with drugs? And they had huge amounts of people um, addicted to drugs. Um, and it was just, it was, it was chaotic. And so they took a really bold approach, I think, didn't they, if, if, if I, if I remember this correctly, um, and they decided to treat it as a, as a health issue, as opposed to a criminal issue. Are you advocating for something, for something similar to, to re, to, to look at it through a different lens of, of health as opposed to criminality? Yes, absolutely. And, and, and it's an important point about the Portuguese decriminalization model is that it, it, it it, de it decriminalized the possession uh, of drugs, but it didn't just do that. It also introduced and instituted a health-led response to drug issues. Yeah. So if someone you know, was, was found in possession, the default position was not arrest that person, but the default position was um, give them or, or send them to, to some working at support and advice so they yeah. can talk about, talk about potential drug issues. So it's, it's, it's a multi... It's a multifactual problem, right? And you need lots of, and you need to come at it from lots of different directions. And yes, absolutely, it needs to be a health-led approach. Yeah. And would you tax drugs? Would the money you made from the taxation of drugs be put it back into the health service and, and, and then help fund things like mental health support and, and social work support and getting off or, or you know, all the things associated with with, with health um, policy? Yeah, you'd hope so. I mean, that people differ on their view on ring fencing taxes and hypothecation, right? Some people, I guess, they, 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 yeah, this kind of arguments for and against how strictly you do that. Yeah. Um, but 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 certainly, uh, our case would be that we would very much hope that um, the uh, uh, in, because, because there is there you know the, the, if you look at cannabis regulation, you know, there, there is significant potential for income generation. What you wouldn't yeah. want that income to do is then just be. Uh, disappear into, into the kind of coffers and be spent on, on on all sorts of stuff. I think there's a very strong argument to say that um, that the income from income from this from the taxed sale of potentially harmful substances mm. should be uh, to a significant degree directed towards addressing the harms that those substances can cause. Yeah. So it feels like you're covering your back a little bit uh, in, a, in, a, in a in a kind of moral way there. Uh, that's my view. Um, so. Let's go through the different models. So on your website, I think there's listed there's five different models of regulation. Um, and presumably these would be linked to the potency, the toxicity um, of, of the various drugs. Mm. Yeah. So uh, one of the kind of core arguments that, that Transform makes is that 
the um the 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 severity of the regulations placed around a drug need to need to reflect the risks associated with that drug and also take into account patterns of use modes of use yeah all the kind of complexity that goes on around uh the realities of uh drug consumption and so um if you're looking at you know very low risk low potency uh, uh substances or, or products like you know a co just coca leaf tea or something yeah, yeah. Um, then you know then then the, the levels of regulation don't need to be as strict all the way up to if you're looking at um uh, heroin where you know you're talking about a a, a medical su medical supervised model of of supply um and 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 then you know in between that you between a kind of tiered licensing type of structure where um, at, you know you can have license for sale on premises, so people can, which is the common one of the common models for alcohol, of course, is is license for sale on premises, yeah. uh, license, uh, off license type sales or pharmacy type sales, which is something that's recommended a lot in our book on stimulant regulation, is that is that you have provision through specialist pharmacy type uh, outlets where the vendors. Are whether where the uh, vendors are trained to provide harm reduction advice, where the amount you can purchase is limited, where uh, we you know we're quite strict on on things like packaging controls and marketing. Yeah. You know, um, uh, you know our view is is that you don't need to add to the uh, attractiveness of, of of any of these substances by putting them in garish packaging and then yeah. having posters and adverts for them everywhere. Yeah. Um, they can you know you know so we're we're our view is that. The marketing side should be very tightly constrained, um, and that the, uh, the 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 sale and the and the strictness of the the, the the regulatory structure around those sales should properly reflect the risks involved, and it should be done in a responsible way. This is about responsible retailing, and it's not about the idea of just leaving responsible re retailing to a bit of server training, or you know, as we as again as we tend to have with alcohol, which is a, well, let the industry just define what responsible sale is. It's about having yeah. a very kind of like interventionist approach. Okay. Where, um, you know, uh, and and just to make the point about the level of intervention, you know, one one of the arguments we make in the our, our recent book on regulating stimulants is is that uh, a model that can be uh, considered is actually state. Uh, the kind of state monopoly model, which is which is the model for off sales of alcohol in in, in uh, provinces in Canada and, mm -hmm. in, and in large parts of Scandinavia, it's not a kind of out there uh, idea that you would mm -hmm. have um, the state uh, having a monopoly on the the, the 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 retail side and to a degree the production side, so that the the the, the, the profit incentive and the kind of natural laws of competition that operate in open markets can be constrained as far as possible. Hmm. I guess that would, I mean, I've got kind of a question on this later anyway, so perhaps we'll come back to that, but I, I guess that relies on uh, a government with, with sort of left-wing economic instincts because you've listed Canada, you've listed Scandinavian countries. These are countries that have, you know, a history of sort of um, an inter, somewhat of an interventionist approach to the, to the economy, whereas I guess in the UK right now, we have a Boris Johnson government that is very much sort of ultra-liberal in, um, in, its, in its outlook. So I guess it wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily expect Boris Johnson to to be the the right leader for for that kind of approach at this stage. Well, to start well, so on on the first point, I'd say actually interestingly in places in, in like Scandinavia and Canada, um, and some U.S. states as well, where they have statewide um, uh, uh, monopolies, is that it's partly about a left right thing. It's also partly about their history of uh, their their history of um, what they did around the temperance movement and the prohibition wave of the early 20th century. And actually, there were just lots of different policy responses which landed differently in different uh, in yeah. different um, jurisdictions. And the, yeah. the state monopoly model is a kind of legacy of that to some extent. Um, but yes, it, it it presupposes an interventionist state. Uh, 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 regarding a particular market, which wouldn't, yeah. you wouldn't naturally expect to be a, a, a kind of a, a core Tory um, policy. No. Uh, having, having said which, though, I think if if you are seriously serious about uh, in an innovative way addressing the intractable the intractable problem of drug prohibition and the harms that it causes, I think that um, being prepared to consider a whole array of different models and, and pretty unusual ones because it is a very difficult problem to resolve and actually uh, you know I, I think it's not inconceivable uh, you mean you may call me <laughs> uh, wishful thinking on this part but I think it's not inconceivable that if you were to persuade governments of almost any stripe 
that um, the uh, the gains to be the gains to be achieved from taking an innovative approach to drug, to drug policy reform uh, are worth it, and that that may mean doing things uh, politically in terms of market regulation they would not naturally do. Um, I think that, that that case is not it's not beyond the the, the realms of, of possibility that that, that 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 case could be could be made and, and could land. Good, I'm glad you said that. Um, the, the next question I have is. Is there precedent at the moment for the sort of entire manifesto that, that you kind of got uh, um, at Transform, or would what you're what you're saying would it be a kind of new sort of like bespoke thing to the UK? Um, if you took the full Transform manifesto, yes, it, it would be a new thing. I mean, one thing Transform uh, are one of the things that we think is really important is that you have to think um, you have to think quite far ahead in order to clear the ground intellectually and conceptually to take those incremental steps that will allow you to both move towards that end goal, but also just achieve the good things that you can achieve along the way. So yeah. for example, you know, our, our recent book on stimulant regulation, you know, it's not like we're, we're, we're gonna, we would, we would go out there now and put it in front of a, a serving minister now and say, here's our model for cocaine, for state monopoly of cocaine provision through uh, pharmacy style outlets. But someone's got to go out and clear that ground and, 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 and look at it and say, look, these are, this is the shape of what those m m uh, alternative markets might look like. Yeah. So that you can start to have that serious and much bigger conversation because it shouldn't just be a, shouldn't just be transformed doing this, right? It should mm -hmm. be a, a, a much, much bigger conversation. It needs yeah. to be. Yeah. But that ground needs to be cleared. Having said which, if you roll back from that and you think about um, cannabis regulation, which maybe 15, 20 years ago, seemed like well that's never going to happen mm. and now you see it rolling out uh, uh in, in 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 parts of the world and not yeah. and far from inconceivable that that would that would happen in the uk mm. Um, mm. and again it's it's the thinking actually of the organizations like transform are doing long before i joined um mapping out those those models saying look it could look like this that now you see actually being taken up by uh, governments in Canada and the US and Uruguay and other places and saying, yeah. oh, okay, well, actually it could look like that. Yeah. And I think, I think in the UK, uh, it's, 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 it's eminently conceivable that uh, 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 a government wanting to, again, deal with the problems of, of uh, drug policy and start with cannabis, because it's an obvious one to start with, uh, could, could quite quickly, I think, uh, decide that, well, actually, why not? Look, this is happening elsewhere. It can happen. We can do it. Then the question from an organisation like Transform is, how do we advocate for it to be done well? And how do we advocate for it to be done right? And how do we advocate for it not to be done in a way which simply becomes a, 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 a market free-for-all where all the worst things we know can happen with poorly regulated markets start to happen yeah. kind of it. Yeah. Um, I guess this brings me on neatly to the next question then, which is about, would we be creating a kind of big business monster here in the same way that we have you know big pharma big alcohol big tobacco who you know i mean i think they they're, they're seen these days in the eyes of the public if, if certainly for myself and many of the people as kind of like the enemy in many ways um and if we were to be adding another one of these big monsters to the world would it not be dangerous particularly when we have political parties like for me the republican party are very very um you know they're, they're, they're in bed these days, aren't they? It's very hard to find a kind of, in my opinion, an honest kind of Republican senator or somebody that hasn't got some kind of funding from, you know, the NRA or, or bit of oil or, or something. Is it, would it be damaging to democracy to add another one of these beasts to the world? Well, uh, yes. I mean, uh, uh, leaving aside the, the question of, of degrees of, especially in, in America, the way in which uh, corporate funding works across the parties, actually, I, mm. I, I'd, I'd say. Okay. Um, I, 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 I think that uh, absolutely. I mean, it is in, 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 in the world of kind of cannabis reform for organisations like ourselves, that is currently the big, the, the big challenge is how do you um, uh, uh, address the inequities and the injustices of drug prohibition uh, without simply replacing it with some uh, corporate beer moth that has no more interest in well-being of, of communities than did the prohibition system, as it were. Yeah. Um, it, it's a real challenge. Now, the interesting thing about that challenge is that um, it's not, it, it's difficult, but it's not, it's not one that can't be met. 
but to meet it requires actually it turns out quite a kind of um clear view of the technicalities of how regulation works because the place where um you know however well intentioned um a, a regulatory system might be quite often the place where um corporate interests do best in terms of owning that market is in the details of things like how does the licensing system work how much the licenses work how many licenses can you have in a particular area is there any provision for the proactive uh, entry into market of people uh, uh, who don't necessarily have the financial clout up front to do that or the training or, or you know or who may be prevented by previous criminal records from doing mm. so there's a lot of uh, a lot of great work's been done in 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 america in particular states like massachusetts and elsewhere where they've in new york recently where they've really thought about this and really tried to get a social equity uh, uh, driven model of regulation so there, uh, so it, it requires a lot of work and it requires a lot of thinking and, and, and a lot of energy is, is going into that because of course, the new cannabis corporates that are emerging and, and undoubtedly they absolutely are emerging, especially in Canada, mm. are, as you would expect, linking up with the big uh, transnational uh, alcohol and tobacco or, uh, corporates, which are working in a, in a similar enough space who understand lobbying who understand corporate capture who understand how to get their their uh, policy um, platform uh, 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 established mm -hmm. and and there's a lot of experience there and there's a lot of resource there there's a huge amount of money there mm -hmm. and so suddenly a lot of the drug reform community has gone from making this case against this apparently immovable uh, uh, beer moth of prohibition to now having to turn its attention to this second uh, incredibly powerful yeah. um, thing which is global global corporate capitalism yeah. that's it's a challenge we have to rise to though mm. because um it is what will emerge it is it is it is a challenge that emerges naturally out of creating mm. a regulated market yeah i guess my my fear is that I, I i look at where parties are at the moment um and i i have a concern with where the sort of some some of the right-wing parties are in in just globally and this is not just me getting on my kind of left wing soapbox here, but I, I feel like there, there are some parties that are, are, are much more happy to, um, to, you know, to, 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 to get into bed with these with these big beasts. So I guess my concern is right now we have an 80, 80 seat majority in Parliament for, the, for a Conservative Party, which, it, it, to my mind, are very happy to do the bidding of, of, of big business. So would now be the right time to do something like this if, if we don't have the right Parliament, because presumably Parliament would be the one that would set the rules and if parliament with an 80 seat Tory majority were to set the rules right now would they not put in a kind of lax rules that would allow them to sort of cozy up with this this, this new beast that's emerging because presumably they would work hand in hand together one would bat the other well i mean our job at, at transform you know our, our part of the the, the 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 jigsaw trying to make the world a better place is to try and deal with the problem of drug prohibition and for, as we were talking about for decades and decades and decades there's always been a reason uh, or to not do that or there's always been a barrier to doing that and, and we're pragmatic in saying that we uh we want to see change happen and whatever the government is at the time that we need to work with to try and achieve that without losing our values and without compromising those values yeah we will seek to work with and if we can make the case to a conservative government uh that uh uh addressing drug policy failures is something that they should do it's then our job as transform and people other similar organizations to do everything that we can to ensure that um if change happens it happens it happens properly and it happens well because absolutely yeah. it's not change at any cost we're not we don't fetishize um legal regulation uh uh to the extent you know, we don't fetishize it you know so that we don't uh, we were prepared to sacrifice our values yeah. to achieve it. It's yeah. not legal regulation is a means. It's not an end. It's mm. not the end. It's not the end goal of our organization. Our organization's end goal is drug policy that promotes human rights, social justice, and public health. Yeah. Legal regulation is, in our view, the best way to achieve that. Yeah. But um, it's not. You know, we wouldn't be like, hey, brilliant, legally regulated, but everything's a free for all. That's mm. a good enough thing for us. Mm. But mm. like I say, having said which, and um, we're also um, prepared to uh, make the case to the governments that are there at the time to make that change and and, and it, it, 
it's an interesting one. And, 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 and one of the problems I think with the Labour Party has had on this issue is that Labour Party has, uh, unfortunately, has a, a, a quite a poor record. The Liberal Democrats have got, have got a very strong record on it. In fact, they've always been, yeah. uh, 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 had, had, uh, had a strong approach on drug policy. But the Labour Party has a very long record of um, weaponising drug policy around the law and order, uh, uh, around the law and order frame. So yeah. that you know, if you get a, a politician who dares to move on, on drug policy. You know, well, Tony Blair did this, didn't he? He, he reclassified cannabis, didn't he? Uh, I think, didn't well, he? Well, that, that, that was a kind of an interesting thing where, where uh, the, 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 the Labour government under Dave Blunkett, uh, uh, um, under, following the advice of the Advisory Council on Misuse of Drugs, reclassified cannabis down to sea and then under pressure from essentially the Daily Mail and other kind of uh, 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 organs um, yep. reclassified it back up again. So there yeah. was, that was a classic case of there was movement, hurrah, and yeah. then there was a kind of retrenchment because- of the, And then they bottled it, yeah. But, but, I, think, but I, think, I think it's also, I, I think also that the- um, was, that, was, that, was that a case of going too soon before public opinion was ready? I, I, I think, it, I'm, not, I'm not sure actually that it was. I think it was probably a case of, of just political, uh, just a kind of calculation loss of nerve, to be honest okay yeah um, and uh, and it was I mean it was, it was very un unfortunate that, that, that it happened but I mean I, I suppose the point is is that there's work to be done on the left as well as on the right around this I mean there are there are conservative arguments for good regulation and there mm. are left-wing arguments for prohibition yeah <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and and you know it's, it's interesting I, I think drug regulation uh, uh, similarly to kind of alcohol policy anyway in, a, in an odd way, it, it, it's, it, it's, um, it moves across some conventional ideological and political boundaries be, because, because it, it's something on which, you know, both a, a libertarian and a, and a progressive, you can imagine, could sit in a room and disagree on many things, but would agree mm. that on drug policy reform. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Don't agree on how to do it. So, it's a balancing act for us to try and fix that problem while maintaining our values, while recognising that you have to, that 10% of something is better than 100% of nothing, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You, you've got to try and get somewhere. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I totally agree. And that sort of an imperfectly regulated Tory uh, attempt at this can always be uh, reformed um, uh, later down the line by a, a superior um, <laughs> a Labour government. <laughs> it's probably how, well, I would, yes. how I would think of that. But yeah. Although if I can jump in on that, I would say this is where the interesting thing that we've seen in America uh, is, is that... The reason why uh, drug policy reform needs to be thinking about those details from the start is, is, it, is it is much more difficult to retroactively fix a badly designed drug policy system than it is to get it right in the first place. Yeah, you've got to make the case for getting it right, and you've mm. got to present the best possible solutions. Yeah, you've got to say, yeah. these are solutions that can work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, your, your line has to be, let's get it right first time and not spend half a, half a century regretting yeah. that we didn't do that, yeah. Totally. Um, I, I wanted to just, I had a question, literally exactly what we just spoke about, but I, I, so I'll, I'll kind of rephrase it here. And it's kind of about how both left and right, you gave the example of, of sort of new, new Labour, but in my head, I was thinking more of kind of like the classic right wing politicians who use or weaponize um, drug, drug policy uh, conversations to sort of strong man the public in moments where there might be a slight rise in crime or where the tabloids are picking up on certain issues. Um, is it in the interest of governments to actually <laughs> come up with a solution to this problem when they would be giving up one of their sort of like best tactics for scaring the public, winning votes? It's very easy to just go out and say, we're going to be strong on drugs or we're going to be strong on crime. A bit the sort of Sean Bailey attempt in, in London. He didn't have any policies. He was just like Sadiq Khan's um, a wimp and I'm going to be stronger than him on, on crime. Is, so is it in their interest to lose that weapon? Uh, so to a large degree, no. I mean, yeah, uh, one of the, again, one of the reasons the war on drugs exists is because it provides precisely the alibi and the language and the stage for that performance of tough on crime politics. Mm. That's part of the reason it exists. Mm. And when you look at the grotesque and extreme versions of that in places like the Philippines, you see where that logic can lead. It can lead to an absolute um, uh, uh, 
out out and out attack on human rights and human yeah. dignity. Duterte is a is is a nut job though, isn't he? I mean, he's a he's a psychopath basically. Well, I mean, well, yes, but 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 look at what the war on drugs can do. It can allow psychopaths mm. to have a apparently or, or a kind of ostensibly legitimate grounds for behaving in that way because because it's very easy to dehumanize people who use drugs and it's even easier to dehumanize people who supply drugs to be honest yeah, yeah. politically and so if you want to have the justification for that kind of a, 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 a politics drug policy is your go-to first landing base you go where can we go to first you go to drug policy so absolutely you're absolutely right strategically um drug policy uh drug prohibition is incredibly useful and so the so the argument you have to make to um politicians who are minded to um exploit that opportunity and 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 as i say i think it's it's been exposed on both sides but yes obviously on the right as law and order kind of like rhetoric, yeah. it's a very yeah. useful thing. Yeah. But what I would say is the the, the, the argument that the reformers have got to make is, is, is to get across to say, you can be, if you want to be seen to be innovative and actually doing something that hasn't just tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed, if you're, if you're, if you're positioning and, you know, and I think there's a lot of positioning now, you know, around, Hey, we're going to do things differently. We're going to do things in a new way. Well, if you are, then simply rolling out the tired images of a, Home Secretary standing in a trench coat over the road from a drug bust and saying that's us fixing the problem. Yeah. I don't think many people even believe that any longer. And uh, certainly the, the Home Office's own independent review of drugs was very clear in saying the evidence suggests and shows that uh, those kind of drug busts do not resolve things in the long term and very often make things worse because they simply create a gap in the market where new operators come in and fight each other tooth and nail to, to get that uh, now available piece of, of, of the market it doesn't mm. so i don't think many people i don't think a lot of people look at that stuff and really and really think to themselves oh you know, yeah that's fixing it no i think i think i think i think people may look at it and go oh god those people are getting their comeuppance which is mm. which is which is a slightly separate issue i don't think that's necessarily the same as those same people if you sat them down and said but do you think it really makes a difference i think most of them would say no, I don't think it does make much of a difference, to be honest. Certainly that's the case for a lot of police. You know, and, you know, the numbers of police who work in this who will say, do you know what? I spent six months busting that gang or busting that supply or cutting that county line thing. And within literally days, it was replaced. You know, I don't know if you've ever come across Neil Woods, who's an ex-undercover police, uh, a drug uh, a policeman, who um, he, he, he tells the most... Uh, ch bone chilling stories of just the, the things that he went through as an undercover cop infiltrating drug supply gangs you know threatened with machetes you know threatened with his you know all sorts of terrible terrible things that he would go through and they do these operations they take months to months to complete they close down a supply network and within two hours another one would have sprung up in its place you know and it, it, it's it's amazing to hear him speak because you get this kind of sense of just the just the visceral futility of the whole thing now I, he's clearly not alone in that yeah um, and i i think again our job at saying transform and, and and people like us is to, is to is to make that case and say look you know this doesn't work really we know it doesn't work really we all know that it's it's it's, it's beneficial and it has a strategic value to you rhetorically speaking but if you're really, if you're really committed to the kind of innovative approaches to to, to solving the problems of the future that you mm. that you claim to be, which most governments will claim to be, then you've got to be prepared to say, let's try something different. Mm. I just, a, a quick follow up on that: um, is it is it more important to convince, to to, to lobby up or to to reach out? Is, is is it more important to convince the public who can then pressure the government, or is it more important to try and get top down action on this? Uh, I think it's both. Um, you know, the, the policy change is, is a strange and mercurial thing, right? And and you never and, and 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 having all of the all of the things in place that are ready for when a, a policy window, as it were, opens is is about and it's about having both public support because you should have public support, right? It's a, <laughs> we we should have public support for a policy change of this scale. So I think there's yeah. an ethical case for public support. There's a there's the case that 
MPs will not move on this as long as they think that the public isn't behind them because their their seats are at risk and their and mm. their fiscal credibility is at risk. Mm. Uh, so you need to have, and also the best, the, the most powerful and compelling stories come from people with lived experience who can describe why they are motivated for change. And our annual yeah. child campaign, yeah. for example, has you know families who've experienced the most unbelievable pain and mm. suffering mm. who are speaking out, and that is so powerful when yeah. you hear that. Yeah. So I think on that level, absolutely, this is about a social movement approach. But of course, at the same time, you've got to be presenting policymakers with viable and practical and realistic solutions to the problem that you pointed out, you know, with, with the, 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 the public are pointing out. The public are saying this is a problem, but you don't have a solution to hand. You're not able to say there's also a solution to this problem. You're not going to get very far. So I think it's a you've got to be going in both directions at the same time which is a tricky thing for anyone to, to, to do yeah, with limited yeah. resources yeah. but uh, that's again that's how we see it yeah totally good um uh, two final questions then before we before we finish um so a guy called viv um Armin, i think who you have on your youtube channel um who is a uh, formerly of the advisory council for the misuse of um, drugs said that black men are disproportionately represented in the criminal justice system and in the mental health system, um, and he blames partially the Misuse of Drugs Act um, and, call, and called it racist in the video. Is the act racist, and if so, how? This is coming back to what we were slightly talking about earlier. Well, as I said before, the 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 approach to drugs that, that the act uh, institutes is racist in its DNA because it came largely out yeah, of yeah. Uh, of demonization that, yeah. and marginalization of non-white communities. Yeah. The, the act is uh, racist in its operation and in its effects insofar as the uh, implementation of the law under those acts has fallen hugely disproportionately on black and other minority ethnic communities. Yeah. So in that respect, yes, it is. And, and you know, the disproportionality um, that you see around the use of stop and search for suspicion of possession of cannabis is huge. It's absolutely mm. huge. And, you know, the, 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 the reality of life for young black men in particular, who, on, who can simply be told, I think I can smell some cannabis. Let me get my hands in your pockets. That is, I mean, the, the, the degree of kind of, you know the 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 the, the hurt and the and the sense of alienation, alienation yeah. and yeah. anger, so yeah. justified anger. Yeah, totally. That that that, 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 that causes that kind of sense of constant policing, mm. constant overbearing, disproportionate yeah. policing, yeah. and that could not happen if the Misuse of Drugs Act did not allow it to be the case that mm. on the mere suspicion or the smell of cannabis, you know, the, the, the oh. I, I think I smelled some cannabis. Let me get my hands in your pockets. Again, that is only made possible because you're allowed to do that to someone simply because you can claim you smelled cannabis somewhere in their vicinity. I yeah. mean, when you, when you think about it, that's extraordinary. It's dehumanizing um, as well, isn't it? Completely dehumanizing. It's, it's, it's completely dehumanizing. And, you know, there are very few other, again, it's about this thing about drug policy being a, a kind of, a, both a justification and an alibi and an, and an instrument for mm. uh, a disproportionate policing mm. that you can think of very few other grounds on which that kind of intervention is allowed to take place but smell of cannabis well cannabis is legal you can smell it so there you go there we've got our grounds for 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 for, 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 for doing that so yeah. absolutely and you know the, the testimony of you know uh uh, uh People from black communities and you know on the experience that they have and we have people in our animals child campaign who who articulate this people like viv we're working in partnership with um an organization called black socks at moments which viv, which yeah. viv which, yeah. which which we're going to be for the next couple of years really trying to uh, um, create spaces in which that experience can be expressed but by the people who are experiencing it because one of the challenges with drug policy of course is it's tends to be articulated you know through you know, I'm a white middle class man, and I'm I'm kind of safe to talk about this to yeah. a degree. Yeah. You know, it, there's a, there's quite a lot of privilege around the, the ability to talk about this without the kind of risks that are associated. Mm. I'm not going to walk out in the street and get stopped and searched. No, 
So, you know, and so there's a, one of the things we need to we need to do is to is to create spaces in which the people who are experiencing this on a day to day basis are able in a safe way mm. to articulate and express that experience and also articulate and express their views on how it should be resolved. So, you know, there's, a, there's quite a lot of which I think we need to really, really expand the conversation here and allow people with those lived experiences to be to be leading in terms of describing what it's like and, and saying what the alternative should be. Yeah, totally agree, totally agree. Um, final question then. So on the 17th of June, we had the debate in Parliament um, and obviously there was a lot of cross-party um, support for, um, well, just, just uh, for a, a conversation for a start. So the question I have is, is there now a shift in appetite to repeal this act and to do something uh, closer to what you guys have been advocating for, based on what you saw in that in that debate, well, um, we would absolutely say that there is. So uh, ahead of that debate, you know, we um, uh, managed to get over, uh, over fifty. Uh, we had the target of getting fifty MPs to sign a statement calling for a review of the act by the time of the anniversary, and we we got that and more. Um, we, we, you know, we thought that might be a real challenge, and it was diff mm. It was kind of difficult, but it wasn't anywhere near as difficult as we thought it was going to be. Mm. Um, and then we had, then we, so we, we've got, we've got the MPs who signed the statement. We've got a, an early day motion, which a number of MPs have signed as well. We had the, uh, the 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 debate where, as you say, MPs from across all parties were passionately making the case for at least a grown up conversation about the alternatives. Yeah. Our view is that we there's know, an APPG on 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 this, isn't it as well? There's an APPG and drug policy forum, and we held a meeting with with, with other APPG, and there's a cross party group on alcohol, drugs, and justice. We held a joint meeting of those groups the week before uh, the act, um, the uh, anniversary of the act, which was very well attended. Again, from across parties, again people speaking out. I think what it is is. Um, there's a certain amount of kind of like a meerkat effect, I think, here, where you need people to stick their head above the parapet and go, it's OK, actually, it's OK to have this conversation, because I think the more that people look across and, and see that that can happen and the sky doesn't fall in. And in fact, constituents look at it and say, well, thank God someone's actually talking about this in a different way. It takes bravery then, doesn't it? It does. take. It takes it takes bravery. But I think the more people who do it the more you'll get that snowballing effect. Because what we, yeah. we know we know for a fact, there are many, many more MPs who feel uh, yeah. the same way, but for different do you think Do you think it's a significant yeah. enough hill to die on, as it were? Well, I, I, I think one of the problems is, is that drug, drug issues, um, it's, so drug harms, it's one of those things that cuts across a huge number of other social issues but it's not always the presenting part of that, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. You can have all sorts of issues where what you're looking at is homelessness, what you're looking at is um, hospital admission, what you're looking at is, you know, I know prison populations. Mm. And it may be one, only one or two steps below that where you hit the drug policy issue. Yeah. But because, you have to, because it's not the presenting issue, it yeah. doesn't always appear. Yeah. And part of our job is to be able to make the case and say, if you look at all these different social problems, you don't have to drill down very far and you find that drug policy is part and a significant part of that problem. Now, we've got to make the case that a lot of people at the same time have got to be prepared to drill down that far and say, yeah, got, I see that too. Let's address that piece of the jigsaw. And that is undoubtedly a challenge. But we've been incredibly heartened by the response that we've had so far to our campaign, incredibly encouraged by it. We're very confident that, that, that the campaign has momentum now. We have more and more people supporters writing to their MPs, contacting them, asking them to speak out, getting responses from those MPs. We've got more MPs obviously talking to each other. We're, we're confident that, the, you know, the, the kind of threat of a media pylon isn't there. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, you know, our view is, is that if people, and this is a kind of message, I suppose, to your listeners as well. Is yeah, that, this is what I was going to end on. Yeah, brilliant. It's exactly, it's the same for, it's the same for everyone. Uh, you know, all, all of us in you know who aren't policy makers if we think this is an issue <clears throat> and we agree that it's a fail that, that there's a failure that needs to be addressed we, write to your mp get yep. that letter out it, you know it's you know it's funny like we're all really really busy and it's difficult it's like, oh god i've got a million things to do and that's one mm. thing i do but we would say in this year when it's the 50th anniversary if we can't what we need to get is that one up the opportunity we have right now for people who 
maybe wouldn't naturally get involved in it, but who do see that there's a problem there to just do that one thing of just writing to their MP or, you know, hashtagging 50 years of failure and, and getting, raising that volume so that everyone starts to again look across and go, yes, we've all seen this problem, this Emperor's New Clothes issue that we have. And in this year of the anniversary, if as many people as possible can just do one small thing and activate in that one small way, the amount of buzz that will create, if everyone who thinks this is a problem was to do one small thing, yeah. to run to their MP, the amount of noise that will create overall will be huge. Yeah. And that's what we're aiming for. You heard him, guys. You know what to do. <laughs> James Nichols, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, James. Cheers.